Hey. Hi. How's it going? Good. How are you? Good. I've never done this before. This is so cool. <laughs> I've never done it until the signet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Uh, how, where are you? Are you at home? I am at home, yes. Um, we're lucky to be in San Diego. The, the weather is nice today. It's always nice. So, yeah, happy to kind of stay at home for a little bit here. Where do you live? I actually live in Mira Mesa, um, mm. so further up north um, than where Signet is. So usually it takes me like 25 minutes with no traffic, and it could be as long as it needs to be if there is traffic. So, yeah. And how is life? How, is, how are you and Ben? We, we are doing good. Um, I think uh, it, before the shutdown happened, I would have been out of town for like a month and a half. And that, I think that was the longest that I was going to be out of town. So in, in a weird way, um, I was a little bit relieved uh, to, to be able to be at home. Uh, those two shows got canceled. Um, and so uh, being able to be at home, spend time with Ben and also with our cat ha has been kind of nice. Um, so it, it was kind of a relief to, to have to not go. So, yeah. Oh, are those shows going to be rescheduled or no? Well, um, I think that they, I, I have had some shows started to get rescheduled, but I think those two have not yet. Um, the first one was going to be with Indiana Rep and it, it would have been my first show with them. Mm -hmm. um, and I, it was like, I think the day I was supposed to fly out for tech was when um, the shutdown was. So, um, oh, I kind of jumped out there. Um, yeah, so um, I, I couldn't get go there. And so essentially, we did like a final read through and we got to see everybody. So that was nice. And the other show we had, uh, it was Pipeline with Dallas Theater Center. And they had just we had just started rehearsals. So I think they were kind of like, we'll just stop it here. So that, that's kind of a bummer because I wanted to work with those people. But it's okay. Yeah, that's yeah. Sad. yeah totally. It's very yeah. sad. Yeah. Um, so how, why don't you start by telling us your journey, your creative journey into sound design and how you got to where you are now? Sure. Yeah, totally. Um, so I grew up playing the piano. Um, I also played the flute um, in high school. I played piano competitively. And then um, I, the, the story I always tell is I, I realized I was not a performer. Um, there was a Bach competition um, through California. And basically I got to the final rounds and um, you had to play um, essentially a box suite and it has five movements. Um, you know, there's a pro prologue uh, and uh, four different dances. And basically when I got to the third dance, I blanked and I tried to start over and I couldn't. Um, <laughs> and I was like, I am not gonna be a performer. I love music, but I'm not gonna be a performer. So I knew then that I wasn't gonna be a performer, I, but I wanted to continue to like explore music somehow. So when I went to college at UCSD, um, I did go and um, I studied biology, um, but I had a music oh. minor. Um, and basically it was my third year, fall quarter. So the first quarter in my third year, um, I was taking OCHEM and I was working in a lab and I was miserable and I hated it. Um, and so I was like, I, I can't continue to live this life, but I have nowhere to go. Um, I will, why don't I pursue what I can do with music? And um, at that time I had to take a GE. So I took um, actually um, a theater design class. And I was like, oh, there, there's this thing where maybe I can use music and theater design together or something. And so basically I took a class, uh, I, I changed my major to something called interdisciplinary computing and the arts. It's, it's still a major that's around at UCSD. Wow. And either you can um, choose to focus on music or choose to focus on video, uh, uh, film. And basically the classes you take are very general. So a lot of the classes I took is like, here's how to use microphones. Here is a class about recording. Here's another class about producing music. And so all of us that came out of that program, um, some of us came and became DJs. I, I don't know um, if people are familiar with DJ Shammy, um, who DJs at the Playhouse. He was from that program as well. So he went the DJ route and some people went the film route. And I, um, because of my designed, um, design class that I took, I was like, let me try out theater. And uh, Joe Hupper was the sound shop supervisor at the La Jolla Playhouse, which they have, um, it's on campus. And so basically I went to him and I was just like, I don't know anything about sound design. I play the piano and I want to be involved. And basically he was like, why don't you come and assist me and see if this is something you want to do. Um, and basically I assisted him on one show um, 
at UCSD. And then um, I went, uh, I guess we ha I had a great time. I learned a lot. Um, the, the most that I remember from that show was um, we had subwoofers under the seats and there was an oh. earthquake that happened and it shook the whole theater. And I was like, this is the coolest thing ever. Wow. Um, and then that summer I assisted him all over town. Um, and then basically at some point he got too busy. And so some of the theaters asked me to do the shows. And then um, I just kept going from there and it's 10 years from now, from then. And um, here I am. <laughs> so wow. yeah, I haven't stopped since. So it's kind of crazy. And Joe is married to Maggie Carney, right? Yes, he is. Um, I, I would have to say, I think she had a lot to do um, with how I ended up, you know, working with him over the summer. Um, he had told me that, you know, I, I was just a student at UCSD and basically he was telling her like, oh, you know, I like working with her and she seems like, you know, she's really into this, but I don't know. And Maggie's like, why don't you give her a shot? Why, does, why don't you let her shadow you around town? And then um, wow. he did. So that, that's kind of cool. Yeah. All, our audience will know Maggie from a lot of shows she's done at Signet as an actor. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, what? So, but you, so now you teach occasionally at your alma mater, UCSD, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm an adjunct professor. And so what that means is, you know, I'm not full time there. And so some quarters when they need somebody, they, they call me up. So this quarter I am teaching a grad, the first year grad, uh, students so they're all of like the designers so I have three stage managers a costume designer a scenic designer two lighting designers and one sound designer and so it's kind of just like a crash course of what sound designers do and I'm also teaching that for the undergrads um, and that you know there's a lot of science majors in there and I always tell them that I would love to draw them to the dark side like I was drawn um, I did notice somebody who joined um, Dave I don't know if he's still on but he was actually one of my first TAs and um, I mixed one of uh, his musicals. I think it was his thesis. It was Three Penny Opera. And I had never wow. mixed before. And basically, he was like, do you want to give this a shot? And I was like, OK, let's see. Um, and so I, I got really into that after. Yeah. But wow. yeah. <laughs> Hi, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so how do you find work now? So it, it's been interesting. Um, I actually. You know, um, so my husband, Ben, is also, he's the education director at North Coast Repertory Theater, and um, they are doing, for his theater program, they're currently doing a production of Animal Farm, and so um, it's trying to see um, how to bring those shows online. So essentially, he's um, doing everything through Zoom, and um, we're actually exploring something called Twitch. Um, if, if anyone's a gamer mm -hmm. out there, mm -hmm. um, the, uh, basically you kind of broadcast your screen. And so the idea of it is like all the audience don't have to clog up our Zoom room and um, they can kind of watch and have comments on the side. And, um, you know, so I spent a lot of time kind of like figuring that sort of thing out. Um, so that that's kind of like one project that I'm kind of involved in. But um, U uh, University of San Diego, um, their Old Globe MFA program, um, we're still doing Jose Rivera's The Promise, actually. Today is the first day of filming. So what they've done is they're also um, rehearsing on Zoom, they're recording Zoom, and um, James Vasquez, he's the um, director, and his husband, Mark Holmes, is kind of our videographer. So essentially, um, they're creating a film, and I am scoring that. Um, and yeah. It's, it's fascinating because I, I had always thought, oh, you know, they're, they're so similar. Maybe we can, I can cross over. But what I'm realizing, it, especially with acting with Zoom, is that, um, you know, we're all acting like this, looking at the camera. And, um, you know, Jose Rivera, the way that he writes is very, uh, there's a lot of connection. It's very central. And so it, uh, this particular story is about two lover, star-crossed lovers, essentially, that can't get to each other. And there's a pivotal moment where, you know, they hug and kiss and, you know, that sort of thing. And so I find that um, typically in theater underscoring, I try not to, like, put on emotions in the music. I kind of, like, try to mm -hmm. highlight what's going mm -hmm. on as opposed to be like, here's how you need to feel. But I'm finding with, like, this kind of scoring, it's like, okay, we, we see that they're both looking at the screen, but how do you create that, like, romantic tension and I feel like it's all in the music. And so yeah. I'm fighting against myself because I'm like, oh, we need, we're focusing on the words, but at the same time, but we need that extra support to kind of like bring it all together. So it's been fascinating to kind of rethink what I think underscoring is. So yeah, that has been fun. Wow. Yeah. Um, and what are you doing now? To, what, what's your day to day like at home? Um, it's kind of funny. Um, I think that it's, 
because you know we're spending so much time on our screens i feel like we're always in one meeting or another whether it's like a like a friend one where you you know call someone up and zoom with them or you're like on a meeting for something else or like in a rehearsal and i find that when there's two people in the house trying to do that it's almost like you're also working their schedule right so it's like right now Ben is trying to be thoughtful and kind of like tucking away in his corner. So when his rehearsal starts in a little bit here, I'm going to tuck away and try to be quiet until he's done. So I feel like it's, it feels almost like you're, run, you're two different people because you're, you know, you have to be mindful with that. And I think we're lucky enough where we have a little bit of distance so that uh, me talking so excitedly, it's not going to pick up on his mic. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that um, doing Animal Farm is smart. I'm teaching a collab class at San Diego State right now. Uh -huh. And the show that I'm teaching is Animal Farm. Oh, okay. <laughs> because it is, it, it, it's just it, living in, um, we're, we're living in an Orwellian time. So yeah. it's interesting working on that play right now. It's crazy because, I mean, I, I, he obviously picked this before we knew this was going to happen. But, um, you know, we were talking, we, were wa we watched Stephen Colbert. That's our, like, late night show that we watched together. And I think we, we were having a discussion about how, like, the discussions he's having with his students are more political than, you know, usual. But it's like you can't help but be political because it is all happening now. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's definitely fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so... I've, I mean, you know this, that you're one of my favorite collaborators to work with. Um, do you, it, and it doesn't have to be a signet job. Can you, <laughs> can you reflect back on something in, your, in, in the past that you've been really proud of and talk about it for us? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I saw you had listed that question and I, I was thinking about um, a couple of things because I, I feel like um, my career has taken me to places that I never thought I'd go. So um, I guess um, I always think that every new project is kind of, you know, this journey and, you know, uh, the most recent one I did with you was The Great Leap. And every time I come out of doing a project with you, I'm just like, we got to do this again. Like, I don't know when, but we have to make this happen. Um, but there are some that are just burned in my memory for different reasons. It's uh, the craziest show that almost broke me. Um, yeah. I did a show in China. Um, it was a collaboration with the company Broadway China and um, a company in China, CBC, they're a big television company. And basically they came together to do a site specific um, immersive theater piece. Um, and it was a story of Peter Pan, and which is not actually a popular story in China, which is fascinating. They have different legends, but Peter Pan is not one of them. So essentially what we did was um, they rented out a giant warehouse um, the size of like two football fields. And essentially we were there to like build the set. And so, um, you know, there was a full length pirate ship with the upper deck and a lower deck. There was Tinkerbell's land, there was native camp, there was mermaid lagoon. And so all of these different elements. And essentially it was a 45 minute piece where people wander around and experience what's happening. So it's a lot like a uh, sleep no more. I think one of the producers for sleep no more also kind of helped produce this. Uh, my role was the associate. And so they had been conceiving this play, this piece for, for a year. And they were in China for about a year in Beijing. And I was called in last minute um, because the two composers who composed all, all of the music, um, they couldn't be there for tech, which was a month in December. So I was called in to go. Um, and basically, um, you know, the, it, it's one of those things where uh, first, um, I think everybody on the team, they didn't speak Mandarin, they only spoke English. Um, and I was the only one that kind of spoke both, um, but my parents are from Taiwan, and I didn't realize how different uh, my Mandarin was going to be from, um, you know, a mainland uh, person from Beijing, just because also in China, there's so many dialects. So my taxi driver, I might not even be able to communicate with them because the kind of um, Chinese they spoke was different than what I could understand. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of like cultural things that we all were trying to figure out. Um, but I think it's just um, taking on such a big project. Um, you know, they, they also... Um, a stage manager was not something that they've experienced before. Um, the director is also always um, responsible for everything. So they're responsible for like, what is the set going to be? What is the schedule going to be? Where are the actors going to be? Who are the designers? Like that it all falls on the director. Mm. And so we introduced the idea of, um, of a stage manager and it was a little bit weird because they're like, how come they're only in charge of one part of this thing? Shouldn't they be in charge of the whole thing? And it's like, no, 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 that's what the director does. But stage manager is all about time. And so the mm -hmm. technicalities of that show um, blew my mind a little bit just because everything, so lights, 
projections and sound, they were all connected to the sound computer and everything was based on a timeline. So wow. everything was happening at the same time in 45 minutes. And so, you know, like Peter Pan might walk from the pirate ship to the Mermaid Lagoon um, and, you know, figuring out like what time he needs to get there so that he can have the fight with Captain Hook because Captain Hook had just left Tinkerbell's land or something like that. So figuring out the technicalities of that. Um, and on top of it, we had three different sound mixers and only, you know, there were pro it was probably a cast of 50 people and only six people were mic'd. Wow. And so it was just all of the, I think it was the first time that um, I felt like I couldn't actually finish my list of to-dos. And it was the first time where, um, you know, you, you go to bed at like 3 a.m., but you're up at 4 a.m. because you're like, oh, my gosh, what, how can I finish everything the next day? And I was just like, this is, this is kind of insane. Um, and so I think that it was the first time. And then after getting through it, you're like, I, I can do anything. Like we have rules here when we have tech, we have somebody telling us if we're taking too much time. So, you know, this is totally, um, and anything is doable. So I, I think that was the craziest show that I've ever done. What an undertaking. Yeah, yeah. It, it also was weird because I was the, the last element coming in because everyone else had been there for a year and I kind of just like was there the last minute. So it, it was kind of interesting to, to feel out that dynamic as well. Um, but I guess the, the, the recent show that I, I guess has been the most interesting and I, I'm proud of is um, I did a show, a site specific show um, with Alabama Shakespeare Festival. Um, we had a world premiere play called Buzz and it was based off of the true story of um, a 1960s director, Marianne Goodbody. Um, and she actually directed Ben Kingsley in the 1960s version of Hamlet that, you know, later became to fame, but ultimately, um, she was a 25 year old who came in to RSC as like the associate artistic director. And basically she had to get people coffee and people treated her poorly because she was a woman telling her she couldn't direct, et cetera. And so um, learning about her journey and how she couldn't get where she needed to be. I felt like that that's such a great story to tell in this uh, climate. And um, the way that she did her Hamlet was basically they would not give her a stage space. So she built her own tin shack out of like, you know, whatever was left over from the main stage productions in the middle of the woods. And so um, Alabama Shakespeare decided to do this play um, in their scene shop. And I, I found that it was so it was a fun challenge to kind of figure that all out um, because we were limited to like seven speakers and then there were only 17 lights which is so impressive to me just because um, i know how uh, lighting is so important but you know they she was very limited in terms of that so i felt that um i applaud them to, um for telling a story like that and also like letting us create in the medium that the director wanted to to do so i thought that was really cool wow yeah do you, a lot of people I've been talking to mm -hmm. here have talked about the future of theater and what it will look like after this. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them bring up that, that we'll see more site-specific shows. We'll see more immersive shows. Mm -hmm. We'll see more shows that aren't about sitting in an audience. Do you agree with that? I feel like we have already started going that way. I feel like there's there has been a lot of that sort of theater. Um, you know, I feel like uh, someone like, you know, the La Jolla Playhouse, especially they have their Without Walls Festival yeah. um, and, and things like that. And I find that people are interested in that in the sense that, um, you know, it's almost as if it's, you know, back in the 60s during the Dada movement um, when they have like happenings. And I feel mm -hmm. like um, that's what interests mm -hmm. people is because, you know, mm -hmm. I want to go to a supermarket and then all of a sudden 10 people start singing to me um, because, you know, there's something magical about that. And I feel like, you know, we all live very grueling lives and, you know, life is hard. And um, I feel like uh, when we have bits of magic like that, it gives us hope. And so yeah. at least for me, I would like to think that we will see more of that. Yeah, yeah I love I love that you bring up the, the da da happening <laughs> because I've been thinking a lot about, you know, what what do what would I want once we're allowed to be in a group together? What mm -hmm. do I want? And part of it is like I just want an event. I wanna I wanna go to an event of people and we're just listening to funk music and dancing for mm -hmm. twenty minutes, and then we're yeah. doing you know whatever it is. It's just like an explosion of creativity or whatever it may be. Um, not to say that 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 na the narrative form of sitting in a dark space is gonna die. <laughs> mm -hmm. Obviously, we both love that. Yeah. But I, I do think that there there is something about the happenings. Yeah. Totally. Um, what do you, 
when you were talking about all of the, all everything going into one computer, I was thinking, I was like, that would never, that could never happen <laughs> in Signet because our computers couldn't handle all that information. <laughs> we tried, we tried with Great Leap. Um, you know, I, I think Blake and I were talking about that, but yeah, I think um, it's, um, well, I, I feel like, you know, um, the systems have improved since then. So I hope one day we can do something crazy like that. I'm all for it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, what do you, um, do you think anything else will shift once the doors reopen? Um, I feel like it's just the way that maybe people will interact with each other, but I don't know that um, our art form, it's like you said, uh, there are always going to be people who will love sitting in the dark room watching a show, you know? I feel like, um, I feel like um, we will continue to have things like that, but I wonder if it might shift in, you know, this new age of using computers and trying to figure something that out. Um, I was watching uh, Craig's interview yesterday um, and he had mentioned that, you know, even when you're so, you know, watching the National Theater do Treasure Island, but then it's like, I have to check that email or like my, I got to feed my dog. Um, I, I feel that a little bit, but I feel like that also gives um, the audience a little bit of a chance to relax. So I feel like, you know, it's almost as if, you know, when you watch Netflix or you watch, you know, your favorite TV show, you can also be doing those things. And that's part of what the experience is to make it, um, you know, enjoyable. So I'm wondering if um, there might be that kind of theater that comes out. Um, even, um, I, I feel like some people ask me then, well, is it like, then are we just watching a film? But um, I feel like, you know, if, even if we're on live, you and I doing this now, we're, we're still like responding live. And so I feel like there's still a little bit element of that. Um, and one thing that I find is, especially for people who get, can't get to the theater, wh whether it's because, you know, they live in Canada, but the show's happening here, it, it gives them um, a chance to see that. Um, and I feel mm -hmm. like um, more people are able to see things that otherwise they wouldn't be able to, um, or even just, um, you know, thinking about how like, you know, the, the time maybe, you know, 7 p.m. is too late for some people to go to theater, but then if there's an option of it streaming earlier or if I can watch this later up to 30 days or, you know, something like that, it, it will bring people to be like, okay, well, I don't have to freak out that I can't see it today. I still have an option and I, mm -hmm. I'm willing to come and see it. So, yeah, it might shift a little mm -hmm. bit and I think that that could be fun to explore. Um, maybe selfishly. Yeah, selfishly for sound, because I feel like um, what you have is the image and the sound. And so I feel like um, mm -hmm. sound will be a, a little, you know, as a partner working with actors and directors in that way. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, have you felt like a pioneer in your field at all? Because um, I, I sort of view you that way in a, in a little bit. Oh, that, that's really I nice. Mean, the um, way you approach sound is, 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 is unique, I think. Oh, um. I guess I, I've never felt that way. I, I, I guess I, um, I try to, um, I always try to challenge myself. I, I think I tend to not try to do the same thing over and over. So if there is a way that um, I can interpret my director or my project a little differently, I'm interested in doing that. So if it's a hard, harder way, maybe we should try it and see if it mm. will work, you know? So I feel like I, I'm interested in kind of um, doing that. Um, I always have felt that um, I always try to be in the center of like, uh, you know, that I always talk about the two sides of sound designing where one side is very technical and one side is very creative. And I feel like it's um, the most successful when it's kind of kind of meets in the middle. Um, and so I, I find myself that um, in terms of the technology, I feel like sometimes I have a lot of trouble with it. And so, you know, learning new technologies is always a little slower on, on my end, but I, I'm feeling like a lot of my um, colleagues who are in sound, you know, I know somebody, th the biggest thing with Zoom is that like, you know, there's like a timing delay, right? Um, and like, you know, all of us musicians can't get together and jam in the same way that we would do. And so I know people who are working on some sort of like emulator where it kind of captures everyone's delay times and then does like a standard deviation where it kind of, makes everyone sync together and things like that. And I find that so impressive. So I'm, I'm looking towards people like that to create tools that then I can take to use to, to somehow, you know, make it a little bit more accessible and that sort of thing. So I, I don't know that I'm the inventor of any of these things, but I do try to like implement some of these newer, newer ways just to see. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, someone told me once, they said, it's a good barometer of if I'm going to like someone or not, 
based on their opinion of you. They said, if they don't get along with Melanie, then I'm not going to get along with them because she's the easiest person to get along with. Oh, is that true? Oh, that's so nice of them. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. What are you looking forward to? It sounds like you're doing a lot of interesting things and you're staying super creative right now. Yeah, um, I I guess I, I never saw it this like this, but I, I'm I'm very grateful that I'm getting all of this all of these things um, to do. Um, I you know I try to also shut down for a little. I think for the first two weeks of quarantine, I try to just kind of shut the world out. Um, I played a lot of Dr. Mario. Um, I'm mm -hmm. trying to get good at that. Ben's been playing longer than I have, so you know I'm trying to catch up. Um, but I. I feel like I really miss being around people. Um, I, I would, I'm definitely more of an introvert. I'm definitely, you know, um, try to pull away when, when I'm working. I, I don't, you know, go, go out as often as I, I hope I do and that sort of thing. So I, I find that I am definitely an introvert, but when I have conversations like these or when I see people in a rehearsal, I, I do miss that, you know. Um, I think one of the things that I love about theater is when I go into an empty space and, you know, during quiet time, everything's dark, everything's quiet. And it's that, that feeling of possibility. And I, I'm always nervous on the first day of tech. I mean, I, I've been doing this for a little bit now, um, but every day, the first day of tech, I'm always nervous. Even if we've, even if you've heard everything, um, it's something about like everybody just coming together for that first moment. Um, that's what we spend, you know, hours on the first scene or some, or the first transition top of show. Um, but I, I love that because that I feel like for me, that's what it's all about. And, and I miss that feeling. I definitely yeah. do. So, yeah. I, I agree. There's something about learning the vocabulary of all the artists in the room and trying mm -hmm. to create something cohesive to paint together. Yeah. I miss that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. What do you, I'm curious about what's your process like when you're handed a script? Um, mm -hmm. What, I guess it's twofold. One, how do you, what about a story do you need to have to say yes to it? Mm -hmm. um, let's say money's not a factor. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the other one is how do you then begin to start on the, on the script? How do you break it down as a sound designer? Um, I guess so. For me, uh, you know, they always have the, the three things where it's like money project and people. For, mm -hmm. for me, I think people is the most important. So if this is a director I really like, um, I, I trust them. So anything that you throw at me, I, I'm willing to take, you know, mm -hmm. uh, if it's and um, I think another thing is, is all the other collaborators. Um, you know, there are certain because work freelance, you're kind of jumping around all these different places, um, I feel like there's certain designers that I'm like, oh, I haven't seen them for years and I really want to work with mm -hmm. them. So if I see them on a team, then I'm extra excited to kind of get to be with them again. Um, so I feel like um, it, it's really about the people for me uh, picking projects in that way. Mm -hmm. um, when I first get a script, um, basically um, I read it the first time just to kind of like get an idea for the story. Um, there's so many resources online nowadays. Um, I, it's kind of nice that sound is not a visual element. So nobody has like, I mean, you're not supposed to, but nobody has really recorded somebody else's sound design and just right. like put it on for free. Um, but you know, when there's images, I kind of take a look at like, well, you know, for example, if, if we're doing like Twelfth Night, there's so many different kinds of Twelfth Nights out there. So for me, just kind of looking at that and seeing the scope of where we could go. So it's like, oh, we can go naturalistic or we can go really um, stylized. Okay, cool. I'm glad that there's those options. So I feel like it, it's all about like, how far can we go with this story? And then, um, you know, I, I always like to talk to directors then just to kind of get an idea what they've been talking to um, with the other designers. Because, you know, if um, f for me, you know, picking music and picking sound effects, it's really about the rest of the world. So, you know, w with Pride and Prejudice, um, you know, sh looking at Sean's set and looking at, okay, well, I, I Chris tends to have this more um, whimsical sort of lighting style. Okay, so I know that we can kind of push this a little bit. Um, and so how do we, um, so great, now that I know that, okay, he's not interested in just straight Baroque music, 
then um, what can I do to be within those? And then we went directly and talked about uh, female composers and female artists, right? So that was kind of my place of jumping off. And so then going back and reading the play again, um, figuring out where we can place things like that um, throughout the show. And then looking at the sound effects, you know, like I think written in the script, there were specific sound effects for um, our, the Pride and Prejudice we did, um, there specifically had bells. And so immediately you and I were talking about, well, what, what are those bells? Are, are they live? Are they, you know, recorded? Are they the same bell? Are they different? And I feel like that's kind of where the discussion starts. Um, some other times when um, a play is not as um, abstract as that, where, you know, there's like a dog barking and then the car and then an airplane. It's like, okay, so then does the director, if this play is written in um, 1955, does the director want to set this play in 1955? Okay, if they do, let me look for those kinds of sounds. But if you're like, no, we're setting this, updating it to 2019, okay, then it kind of changes the way that I have to think about sound effects and mm -hmm. okay, and what kind of music kind of ties in with that. Um, what I'm finding is that um, it, it's been fun to kind of, um, a lot of times directors might give me like, these are a couple songs that I like. And so for me, I, I want to honor that but I also mm -hmm. want to like provide other options. And so mm -hmm. if those are the songs you like, I want to find things that are similar, but might not be exactly what you thought it was going to be. Right. So mm -hmm. I, I feel like that's part of my fun. Um, recently I saw a, a meme about how, um, you know, a sound designer Spotify doesn't know how to pin us, especially when we're working on so many shows at the same time. It's just like, <laughs> I'm listening to all, you know, for uh, the great leap, I was listening to um, communist Chinese music right. <laughs> um, and at the same time, 19, 80s hip hop and so I, I think um, I get a lot of strange selections on, on that and that's part of the fun and trying to hone in on what um, this play is about so yeah and I think that you know what really separates your work to me is your your it's not just your research it's your ability to take the research with, there's like an IBM quote that's like <laughs> data data overload equals pattern recognition <laughs> there's something about the fact that like your research is always so incredible to me. And then you're able to pick apart patterns in it and go, hey, what if, you know, what if in act one, it's we're setting up for 1980s in America basketball game. And then when we go to act two, we're in China. And that is a different, I mean, like the way that you're, the way that you're crafting it, it's not like, like you said, it's not like you're stealing anything or taking an easy way out. You're making it very unique to the people in the room. And I think that collaboration theater at its best is when it's doing that. When you're meeting everyone halfway and you're doing the dance of collaboration, it's not about really stealing from another production. It's about making your, this production right here, meeting the moment where it is. And you always inspire me with, you know, not only how much, how much you come to rehearsals, but your research always sends my mind going places where I'm like, well, this is going to impact how I'm staging it. This is going to impact how the lights are going to work. This is going to, you know, and I love that about you. Oh, that, that's very kind of you to say. I, I think I, that, that's exactly what I, what I try to do. I feel like um, a lot of times, um, you know, earlier on when I was working, I, I always felt like sound was always the last person to kind of be slapped on into the group, whether it's like being hired as the last person or, you know, I'm the last person to have a conversation with the director. But um, at least personally for me, I find that music can change my mood or change how I think about something. So I feel like you know, we should have this early on because it's like you said, you know, I, I hope to inspire some sort of, you know, I, I always think that, you know, tr especially with transitions, you know, the funny joke about sound designers is like, we get grumpy when people clap um, during transitions because it's like, that's the only time you hear anything that we've worked on. Um, but it's, it's, it's that idea that I want to continue to tell the story. It's not just lights down and then we're just that's, sitting with yeah. music. Um, that is our opportunity to like show more depth and so, so for me, I, I always like to get in early. Um, I've, you know, some, some directors aren't, aren't as keen about that, but I, I'm like, but this is how I work. I, I want to talk to you from the beginning. So we're all on the same page and sure, maybe, you know, we don't talk again until tech, but at least you have an idea of like what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So I find that um, new directors who haven't worked with me before, sometimes they're like, oh, you know, sound designers don't usually talk to me until the day before tech. And I'm like, but I, I don't do that. I, I want to be part of the process because what you're doing also changes my mind as well. So, so um, mm -hmm. yeah, so I think I, I try to try to keep that open. Um, 
And um, I think that I try to read the script like a piece of music. So um, it's mm -hmm. not just about these random blocks of music. It's about how, how we can thread through from, you know, act one and then act two and that sort of thing. So that's really important to me or else then it's like, why don't we just do a playlist, right? So there has to be some thought that goes into it, at least in my head, so yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, I, I love that you said that because I always view a play as a piece of music and scenes as movements to the music and you can feel it when you're in the pocket, when when the rhythm is playing correctly and when it's not visually and um, uh, what's the word? Orally? Orally, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, what do you feel like you have like a specific mission statement as an artist? Because you've kind of expressed one to me once and I want to know. What <laughs> I don't I don't know. Um, I, I feel like. Um, it, um, there was a time uh, when, when I'm teaching and stuff, I always like look back on what I used to do. And I'm, I'm all, always thinking like, oh, you know, I've been the same from the beginning. But I think mm -hmm. when I go back and look at my old files, even the way that I program something has completely changed. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I realized the way that I brainstorm has completely changed, even though I think that I'm doing the same thing, I'm not. Um, so I, I don't know. I, um, I feel like um, it, it's always constantly shifting. And I, I don't, I don't know that that's a bad thing. I, I think I want to continue to kind of make that make changes because that's the art is continuing to evolve. Um, I, I don't know that I live by by a motto. Do you? I don't remember what I said. <laughs> well, it was we were working on a new play together, and you said part of the reason why I want to do this is because I believe in championing female voices. Yeah, um, I think more. Um, when I was in school, like um, my uh, my mentor had always said that you know all, all work is political, all things you know show show a point of view, um, and I I kind of wrote that off. I'm like, well, you know, a job is a job, and so I, I have to do shows, and that's what what it is. But I think the more shows that I've done, I, I've tended to to do that. So I've tended to pick be really interested in female um, playwrights. Uh, female driven stories as well. Um, and I feel like I'm also really interested in, um, you know, um, talking about uh, the Im immigrant experience and also like um, being a hyphenated American. So, you know, Asian American, something slash American. Um, and so I feel like I've tended to be more drawn to that. And I tend to work on more plays like that. And the more that I do that, I feel, um, I guess, more empowered and more, um, seeing the world in a different way that I never thought that I could with, with art. I never thought that art was political until I was doing it. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. You can't really make it in a vacuum. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, um, um, uh, do you, can, can I ask you like um, a question? You don't have to name names or anything, <laughs> but, <laughs> Because you talked a little bit about, and I think that it's symptomatic. I, I notice it when I, especially when I was an assistant director, the mm -hmm. way that sound designers are treated, um, not given enough time. Uh, certainly people prioritize lighting design a lot in tech. Mm -hmm. and, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit about some bad experiences you've had maybe where you go, I can't work like this ever again. I won't be doing, I won't, I won't come back to this company or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess like first to say that um, I think I've been really incredibly lucky. Um, all of my mentors and all of the people who have supported me have always um, just been really, really supportive. Um, you know, I literally came in knowing nothing about theater and not even sure if this is what I want. And, you know, people have been just helping me along and I, I've really appreciated that. Um, but I think um, being... I guess just even the category of being a sound designer. So like putting aside, um, I guess like, you know, just wor working as a woman in theater, just putting aside that and mostly talking about the sound designer. I feel like um, there's a little bit of, um, I guess, misunderstanding sometimes. I, I feel like because as humans, we're so visual so that, um, you know, when we see a set, when we see a costume, mm -hmm. when we see something, we know, oh, we like it, we don't, or we don't know. Like those are three options. And I feel like you immediately know seeing that. But with sound, it, it's more with time and space, right? So yes, I can play you a piece of, you know, underscoring, but if I'm not seeing with it, with the lights, with the costumes, with the actor, 
it's just me reading on top of music. So as a um, director, how do you know if it works or not in the moment, right? So I feel like what I have to illustrate is much harder in that way. So I feel like um, with directors who um, I work really well with, uh, like you, I feel like there's like a sense of trust because, um, you know, you kind of get an idea of what I'm doing, but you you can't exactly see yes or no, but what, let's let's see it on stage because I trust that you're you're working on something that could work, you know? So I feel like um, with collaborations that are well, there's that trust. I have had um, collaborations with directors where either um, it's a little tricky because maybe they, they aren't able to imagine that coming together or um, one of the, uh, earlier I was talking about like pet peeve questions that designers sometimes get it, uh, and with um, visual people is like, is that the way it's gonna look? On the other hand, it, it's the same with sound when people are like, is that the way it's gonna sound? Then I know that, oh, then I have to navigate this a little bit differently because um, you know a lot of times I, as a designer, I try to give directors um, you know rehearsal sounds. Um, and some people like that, some people don't. Um, I've had both, you know, and I think with rehearsal sounds, I can really tell if the director uh, understands where my brain is going. Because when they say, is it going to sound like that? Because that's not the way it sounded when I was listening to it at home. Then you're like, okay, so I, I have to go about this a different way. Um, so I feel like that, that sometimes those are the most difficult conversations because you're like, okay, I have to show them in reality so it can't be abstracted. And sound is such an abstract thing. Um, and you and I know that sometimes even when you, when we've planned it in rehearsal and it sounds perfect, we get into the space and it just doesn't work. You know, that, that just happens sometimes. Right. And um, so I feel like working with a director who's able to understand that sort of shift and be being flexible with, um, you know, being able to be flexible during tech when things like that happen, that that's what makes a good collaboration, being able to, um, you know, kind of um, adjust as needed, that sort of thing, mm. yeah. Um, on the other hand, uh, I feel like there have been some instances where it's a little bit too prescriptive. So mm. this doesn't happen as often, but you know, it, in earlier years, I think I've always been handed like a CD and be like transition one is song number five. And you know, so things like that. And I mean that, I, I feel like in a way that's a weird way to build trust. I, I've had, you know, I started out working with some directors that way and then we've built a trust and then now we're, we're good, right? But um, I feel like I find directors that tend to think that way perhaps don't mesh well with my kind of process. Cause just like you yes. said, it's that bouncing of ideas that I'm interested in. Um, so I, I can play the track you want, but you know, that's not necessarily fun for me and that's not the best for this production or, you know, whatever, so. Yeah. yeah totally yeah you should just hand the cd back and go it sounds like you're the sound designer it <laughs> seems like that so you should do it yeah. <laughs> i'm redundant at this point yeah. <laughs> um yeah. yeah yeah that's tough um yeah you talked a lot about trust and i think that there is something really vital about in the heat of collaboration you have to be able to trust everyone I have to tr I have to trust everyone to do their jobs mm -hmm. and, and, and sometimes it's I mean I think I think that you know sometimes the uh, from the outside outsiders will say oh you work with all the same people that's not fair and you kind of go yeah but the mm -hmm. amount of time that is saved because yeah. when I work with with Melanie I know what that is and I know that it's going to be a great experience I know that the product is going to be amazing and and I can trust her you know it's in some ways it's like I can have one conversation with you, like you said, and this doesn't happen because we like to talk to each other. Yeah. <laughs> we can have one conversation and then I could not see you until tech and trust that everything you built would be amazing, you know? And, and sometimes you don't have that. You don't, it takes a while to build that trust in aesthetic and taste because mm -hmm. it is about taste and yeah. Yeah. I, I tend to like to think that um, the, the same collaborators kind of get drawn towards each other because you have a certain style and, you know, like, I, I feel like um, I always tell my students that you're hired for your ears, so protect them. Um, yeah. But yeah, uh, you know, you're really hired because of the way that you perceive the sound, because sound is, so, you know, in physics, it's a, a wavelength. And so all of our ears hear it differently. And so if I mesh well with the director, it means we're hearing on the same mood, the same color, the same level. So, um, yeah. That's totally. a beautiful way to think about it. Um, so here's a big question. Yeah. So why do you think what we do matters? 
It, so I, I mulled over this question yesterday. I, I mean, I think this is always the big question, um, uh, but it all, it reminded me of our first collaboration, actually, um, when we were doing, uh, it was a, 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 re a produced reading version of Dust uh, by Danielle. Um, and that play was about a school shooting and a school shooting happened while we were in rehearsal. And, um, you know, it's, so all of us, in the room were there to kind of experience it all together. And I, I think that really shook me. It, it was the first time that something in real life and something on paper kind of just came together uh, for me. And I think you said something where basically you said that, um, you know, we, we have to continue for the people who can't and we have to be that solace for the people who, who need it. Um, and so sometimes I, I feel like maybe I do work or art that is not everyone understands or not everyone agrees with but for the few people who do that that's why I've done it for them like I, I'm giving them a voice when nobody else agrees with and it's my way of like showing that I I, I want to tell your story and here it is um, I I think that that also stems into like doing the um, female driven plays as well as um, Asian American driven plays in the sense that I feel like you know there might be in the case that there might be some people who don't want to hear that story, but this is the story for the people who do want to hear it. And so I think that um, as artists, we might all have a little bit of that. Um, I guess in, in a weird way, art is always a little selfish. Um, also talking about, um, you know, I'm always a little bit unhappy with some of the art that I do, but I'm more unhappy without it. So I feel like I have to do art. Um, I, I always tell my students this as well, where, um, you know, if you can do anything else, you should. You will make more money. You'll, you'll move fast in life. But for those of us who are here, we have to do it. It's just part of who we are, you know. Um, even us in quarantine trying to not do theater, you know, I, I'm growing plants and I'm doing cross-stitching. And it's like we're still creating, even though we're not all together. And I feel like um, we're just kind of, that's our impulse is to do something like that. Whether or not we're in a crisis, we just have to be creating. Yeah. 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 Yeah, we have to tell stories. I, I like that. We have to create and we have to tell stories. And I think it's important to curate the, the right stories and the stories we tell each other and the stories we tell ourselves. Mm -hmm. That narrative is important. Yeah. Um, you know, I can't believe we're almost at time. Oh. I don't know. <laughs> this, is, this has been... This has been the fastest one it feels like, <laughs> that I've done. Um, do you want to say anything to the people watching? Anything? Um, final statements? No, they are, they're free to ask you questions as well if they'd like. That sounds so final and prophetic. Um, I think yeah. I, I'm always the person that's kind of in the dark and I, I tend to follow the, the leader a little bit. Um, so I, I don't have any grand sweeping statement, but um, I guess, you know, we'll, we'll get out of this and we'll be okay. Um, but I don't know if anyone has any questions specifically, hi, Sean, um, that they want <laughs> to um, ask. I can, um, I, I did bring something to show and tell. It kind of ties <gasps> oh, everything yeah, together. Yeah. <laughs> tell me, show me the show and tell. Yeah. Um, so, when you join the union, when you join USA 829, they kind of give you a stamp, right? With your, like your serial number. And basically the idea is when you draw something, you stamp it. Um, so that, that's not my item to show and tell, but kind of a backstory to that. Oh, someone asks, is Wendy around? No, she's actually napping. Sometimes my, my cat likes to hang out in the back and there's a little pillow here that is my cat Aww. as a sound designer. Um, my husband got it for me for my birthday, um, but that's she's not here today. Sorry. <laughs> um, but um, my mentor, Joe, um, the last uh, kind of show that I did there before I graduated, um, he gave me this gift for Christmas and it's a stamp and it's an M. And um, in the card that he wrote to me, he was all like, um, you know, this is a symbol of you leaving your mark um, in this industry and, you know, good luck finding your, you know, find your voice and leave your mark essentially. And so I've always kept it as kind of a reminder um, and so I, I just felt like he was just like, oh, it was nothing. And I'm like, I know, but it means so much. It's like the, just the symbol of what I try to do in my work every day. So, yeah, just mm -hmm. wanted to share that. Oh, let's see. Any particularly challenging or memorable moments of a play you've gotten to design? 
Oh, yeah. I mean, there's so many, right? <laughs> um, but I, I do want to say, I think um, one of the, you know, earlier when I was talking about, oh, hi, RJ. Um, I wanted to talk, I was talking a little bit about um, my most crazy show and then my show that I was really proud of. The other show that really like opened my eyes really um, was Via Gone. Um, that was my first collaboration with Jessica Prudencio. And I think it was my first time feeling that telling an Asian American story was important. Um, I think before then I had only done like one other show about the immigrant experience. And, you know, I was just like, it, it's, it's just another story. But I felt like um, with that one, the way that she kind of brought everyone together made me feel like, um, you know, part of a team, um, part of people who understand what I've been through, what my parents have been through. Um, and I think a, a lot of them um, I still talk to on, online. And I feel like that that is an example of being um, successful where, you know, we all came together to do this life changing project. And then we still connect even as a person on personal levels um, outside of that show. But also that was, I think it was the biggest challenge of a show for me. Um, I hadn't, uh, that show, I kind of also created original music for it. Um, for those of you who don't know, that one had essentially monologues that were in the style of rap. Uh, Oh yeah, that was fun. That was fun. Um, and so I think that with her, we really went in and talked about each monologue and talked about how, um, what kind of style we wanted it. So, you know, like this one is more like Drake and this one is kind of like this. And so, you know, we, we really talked through each of those and what the story we wanted to tell. And, you know, it was also my first time really collaborating with um, the actors and um, I, I've never gotten so close with actors before. You know, there, there's always that gulf between. And that was the first time I felt like everything was bridged. And I was in rehearsals working with them on the beats. Um, our lead, he, um, he was a rapper himself. And so, you know, getting tips from him, because I'm not a rapper. I just know to write these beats and you should just fit the words in there. But, you know, he kind of mm -hmm. showed me how words can be, you know, the ebb and flow of all of that. So I felt like that that's one of the most memorable shows and you know i i'd love to you know collaborate with everyone again on that one so yeah yeah beautiful yeah i'm talking to jessica tomorrow on here i know i saw i think um i have a class so i can't join but i'll probably watch it on youtube <laughs> yeah um well thank you for that show and tell too i think you've definitely met left your mark oh well thank you thank you um i i hope we get to do something again soon um when yes, this all opens and yeah i totally can't wait yeah what well, yes we will i look forward <laughs> to it. yeah totally. well it's always good to talk to you mel same same to you yeah i i love um I think we're very in line in terms of how, how we see theater and I, I, I love your style. Um, I, I hadn't seen, I, I never got to see Shockheaded Peter, but I'm teaching, uh, the class that I'm teaching with the grads is in collaboration with Chris Wren who did Your Lights. Um, and he did a presentation, uh, the students are doing their own versions. They're composing music for each of the songs. So that's gonna be fun. Oh my God. Yeah, I know um, it, some, some of them, I don't know if they're on here, but some of them were a little, it, it's a little scary for some of them and I totally get it, um, but um, I, I realize like that's the kind of work that you do and I'm very drawn to that. Um, I, I even felt elements of that when we we're doing Pride and Prejudice and you know somehow we were still able to bring that into something like The Great Leap and I, I think that's that's so cool and th that's why I, I love working with you. You can probably hear my cat in the background so th that there she is. Yeah that's Wendy. <laughs> yeah so thank you so much. Yeah thank you. I miss you my friend. Miss you too. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Mwah.